this morning We are your children, Lord We live to worship you, God Galatians 4, 6 says, And so that we would know for sure that we are his true children God released the spirit of sonship into our hearts Moving us to cry out intimately, my Father, you're our true Father. Let's sing out, I am chosen together. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Extraordinary men and women went before us with unmatched resilience, enduring hardship when called upon to defend and liberate. They said yes. They found courage to rise with every son, loyalty toward their country, discipline for every command, even in the darkest hours, they said yes. They cherished and fought for freedom, so those coming behind them were assured of it. And when the moment came for them to give it all, their futures never to be written, they said yes. Today, we think upon their sacrifice and find our way to honor them saying yes to making the most of what they gave us and filling the earth with God's goodness. We thank them for their yes. They will never be forgotten. Good morning and welcome once again to our virtual worship service. This Memorial Day weekend, we honor the memories of those who paid the ultimate price so that we could be free. To them, we owe a debt of gratitude. I'm glad that you're tuning in once again to this streaming event. If you're watching on social media, you're able to share this with your friends and family. Take a moment and do just that. It will never be easier to invite friends and family to worship with us in a church service. Each Sunday, as we're in this format, we email you the uh, uh, outline for the message as well as a fun to follow along with uh, kids outline. So we hope that you've already found that in your inbox. And as we begin the service this morning, let's pray together. Lord, once again, we're apart from one another as we enter into our worship time. We miss the laughter that we hear down the halls of the church we miss the friendly greetings, the uplift that we gain from the warmth of our fellowship. However, we know that you're with us. We claim the promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. So as we gather around our computers and our devices, we do so to worship. We do so to be encouraged from the word, to learn and to grow in the faith and to rejoice in the hope that you offer us. 
Today, in a special way, we thank you for the freedom that we have as Americans and for those who sacrificed all so that we can enjoy liberty. We pray that you will be pleased with our worship, and we ask that you bless and encourage us this morning. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord in song. Good morning, Quail Lakes. We're so glad that you've decided to join us this morning for our Sunday service. We pray that from wherever you are watching, that you are relying on the Lord, fully trusting in Him with all that we've been experiencing in this time. I want to open up our time of worship with the scripture. Romans 8, verse 16 says this, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And then it says that now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So let's go ahead and begin this time of worship declaring who we are and how our whole value is in our Savior. From wherever you are, we just pray you'd get comfortable at this time, wholeheartedly worshiping your Lord this morning. Let's sing out, who am I? Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me and know oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. The sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me, His grace run deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died. Declare it. Yes, he died.
of his salvation thankful that he sacrificed all on a cross for our sins I pray this morning church that as you watch this morning you you sense the spirit you feel the love of the father so many of us are facing different trials at this time but we can hold steadfast to the truth of the promises of our God, that he can be our comforter, our protector, our shield, our strength, our guide. So I just pray that you would sense an overwhelming presence of his love over you and remind yourself of all that he paid to have you as his son and daughter of his. Let's sing out this next song together. He is jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so let's sing that out meaning it and oh how he loves us so, oh, how he loves us, how he loves us so. May you feel his love this morning. like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy we thank him for his mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me Oh, how he loves us so Oh, how he loves us How he loves us so You're created in his image, sing it out and Oh, how he loves us so Oh, how he loves us How he Let's raise our voices to him. Yeah, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Yeah, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, 
our prize Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking Amen So heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss And my heart turns violently inside of my chest I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way that he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves. Raise your hands to him this morning. Yeah, he Pastor Grant has our announcements this morning. Thank you, Pastor Mark, and good morning, Quail family. The fact that you're still watching this service streaming pretty much should say that, unfortunately, our weekly programming is still on hold. Each week you hear Pastor Mark saying that if you or someone you know has a high level of need, they can text the word CARE to 209-257-8768. Again, that's text the word CARE to 209-257-8768. We have staff that is monitoring that number. And wait a minute, I'm the staff that monitors that number. Anyways, that number is monitored and we will endeavor to do whatever we can to meet those needs. Thank you for your financial support, your generous financial support. Without it, we couldn't afford elaborate backdrops like the one you're seeing now. I'm kidding, it was free. But again, thank you for your generous financial support. Uh, if you want to give online, please go to qlbc.org and search out the Rebel Give link. It's a blue clickable icon, just click on it and we can receive your ties that way. If you're more comfortable mailing in your tithe, you can mail it to QLBC, P.O. Box 7955, Stockton, California, 95267. It may be that you're tuning in to this streaming uh, service for the very first time. If so, thank you so much for joining us. We're at Quail, we love our guests, but we would encourage you to go to that same, same website, qlbc.org, and click around it, you know, and search uh, the various ministries that we offer. Celebrate Recovery continues to meet. Every Tuesday night at 6.15, they meet virtually on Facebook Live and on YouTube. So search that out and you can join that wonderful ministry. Immediately following this service, uh, we, we would encourage you if you're a family or if you have kids in the house, uh, to, to uh, go to Facebook and search Quail Lakes Baptist Kids. Mike and Sabina Tackett holds, hold Kids Church, and you would have a blast. Your kids will have a blast. Uh, Mike and Sabina are a hoot. The word for you today is our daily devotional, and the next quarter's uh, uh, volume is in. So if you would like that, last Friday, we had a curbside pickup, and we're doing it again this Thursday from noon to 4 o'clock. And we're also accepting uh, gently used uh, clothing to donate to the Gospel Center Rescue Mission, as well as any recyclables that you might have been storing up these past two months. Um, if you have a, uh, a prayer concern, please email qlbcprayer at gmail.com. We have prayer counselors that are monitoring that email address that will pray for those concerns that you have. So that's pretty much all the, wait, hold on, hold on, this coming in. Yes, sir. Right away. Okay. Sorry. All right. Bye -bye. Sorry, that's not news. That's not a news flash. That was Pastor Mark telling me to go put on some pants. How does he know these things? 
He's just the smartest guy I've ever met. Jeez. Whenever we're together, I give you some time to greet one another, and I'm going to do that again this morning. If you're watching on social media or on YouTube, uh, you have a chat function there. So go ahead and uh, send up an emoji or greet one another uh, by, by chatting together. If you're outside Stockton as you're watching this live event, uh, tell us where you're located. Go ahead while the music is playing and let's greet one another. In this time of being physically distant from one another, it's great to connect uh, back together by reaching into our video files and our archives of the This Is My Story video testimonies. Let's watch this one together. Hello, my name is David Juarez. Uh, my father was a professional baseball player in Texas uh, where I was born. We moved here to Stockton and I attended school through junior college. Um, I was blessed to have a lot of athleticism and did pretty well in sports. And unfortunately, I didn't do well in the, the main part of school, which is actually going to school. So I missed a lot of opportunities for scholarships and what have you. Uh, my brother and I were brought up uh, Catholic and I enjoyed going to church. Uh, I learned a lot about God there. But unfortunately, um, I took the wrong road. After my dreams of uh, becoming a baseball, professional baseball player uh, had ended, my working career started. I had a hard time holding on to jobs. I kind of went from job to job due to my lifestyle. Um, but God had always provided and I'm sure he had a plan for me. Uh, I started playing fast pitch softball. I got invited to play and uh, to come on try out. Uh, and it was there where um, God brought a very special Christian man into my life. His name was Jerry Hackett. Um, I knew there was something different about Jerry, uh, that he had something that I didn't have. Uh, he started showing me and talking to me about the love of God. Um, as my life seemed to be going no place, uh, his was going the opposite. About 33 years ago, I was working at a carpet store at the time. And I remember Jerry called the store to ask about uh, some carpet that he might uh, uh, he needed for this upcoming mission trip. He began to tell me about it and I asked if uh, I could uh, go along with them because at that time I just thought maybe getting away would help a little and I was looking for anything. Um, he just told me it was not the kind of trip that uh, I was thinking about uh, but I, I was persistent. I begged him to go. Uh, that's God's spirit I think was already moving in me. So I was ready for my first mission trip, uh, not knowing what a great gift uh, was awaiting. We went to Porvenir, where Mark and Veronica Schultz had just started. One night after a meal, I just started feeling the conviction of God. Um, he was working on me, and I had always known about God and Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, but I had never given my life to Jesus Christ. Uh, I talked to Jerry about this, and. Um, I asked him, uh, uh, he told me what, um, what needed to happen. I asked him, what must I do you know, to be saved? And uh, he explained to me, and I knew I was ready. Um, so I became one of Port Vernier's first converts. Walking the Christian life is not an easy road. Uh, there, as there's been many, many blessings in my life, uh, my children, my brothers and sisters, and. Uh, there's also been very, very many trials in my life as well. Two years ago, uh, one of the biggest and hardest trials uh, of my life hit me uh, when my wife of 22 years asked me for a divorce. Um, my world, um, as I knew it, came crumbling down. And um, I knew that, you know, there was gonna be some heavy trouble ahead. But God is faithful. Although our marriage is over, my walk with God uh, and my relationship with Him has never, ever been better. 
He has uh, raised me from the ashes and has restored me. Um, I know that the prayers that I was asking for more than anything was to restore the joy of my salvation, and he's heard those prayers. Uh, God has now been mapping out my course. Um, the first of the year, I had a blessed opportunity to start a new business again. Uh, I'm in the wholesale auto business, and I called it, uh, named it Mission Auto, uh, as God is faithful. I've been on two mission trips, and I've been blessed to be able to go, uh, to, I'm going to Rancho Sordo Mudo in the next few weeks. Um, I left one important part out, and I wanted to save it for last. Uh, I never really mentioned in, uh, by name the church that I went to, to Port Rainier with, that showed me the love and uh, reached out to me 33 years ago. Um, that church was right here, Quail Lakes Baptist, and uh, all this time, uh, they've been loving me and walking with me with the Lord. Uh, so yes, I have a strong passion for missions and for this wonderful body of believers, but most of all, for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Christ be the glory. My name is Dave Juarez, and this is my story. Oh, mm -hmm.
As we go to the Word of God this morning, let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts, granting us the insight and the understanding that you want for us. We pray for the many people who are struggling during these days of pandemic and the fear that we feel in the face of loss. Some of us have lost our health. Others are losing jobs. All of us are losing our connections and the nearness that we cherish to one another. And so we pray in your perfect timing you will bring an end to this emergency. But now we pray that you will guide us in your word. Show us your way and your truth. You be our teacher this morning, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you have a Bible nearby. Take that Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 4. That's our, the passage that we'll be in today, Philippians chapter 4. And this is the key concept this morning. There is joy in choosing to be content. Today we come to the last chapter in the book of Philippians, and this is the last installment in our series, Unstoppable Joy, as we come towards the, the end of Paul's letter to this church. And so we're going to actually land in the middle of chapter 4 and, and concentrate our thoughts there. But in order to get there, let's review briefly with what has happened previously in chapter 4 of Philippians. Prior to the verses that we'll concentrate on, which are verses 10 through 13, we see that Paul has asked two influential women in the church to end a feud that they've been having, which has been hurting the ministry and damaging the relationships inside the fellowship. He then asks the entire fellowship in Philippi to focus on joy and gentleness in verse 4. And in so doing, they will be the kind of people that others will want to be around. And they'll weave that tapestry of their relationships even tighter. And they'll enjoy the journey with Jesus more and more. He says it this way in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. That's the unstoppable joy that we've been talking about all throughout this series. D.L. Moody once said, Some people have just enough of Christ to make them feel uncomfortable at a party, but not enough of Christ to give them joy anywhere else. May that not be true of us. I hope with me that you want the unstoppable joy that Christ offers. Well, then in verses 4 through 6 in this chapter, he's asked them to turn to prayer in times of anxiety. He's saying, don't carry all the burdens of the present, all the worries of the future, and all the regrets of the past all at once. Leave them in the hands of God. And then in verses 8 and 9, he's asked them to train their thoughts, uh, to train their thoughts on the things of God. Concentrate, he says, on those things that God would value, those things that are true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable, excellent and praiseworthy. Both then and now, that leaves out a lot that we concentrate on or we come across in our daily lives. Paul says, be careful what you let into your mind. In verse 9, he's asked them to follow his example, not declaring himself to be perfect, but he realizes that he is ahead of them in this journey of the Christian life. And so look to me, he says, and part of that example brings us to our passage this morning because Paul says, I have learned to be content. Today we're talking about contentment following the example of the Apostle Paul. So let's pick up the reading. I'll start at verse 10. You follow along as I read. He says this, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you've been concerned, but you've not had opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. Zero in with me on verse 11. I have learned to be content. 
That is a radical, dangerous, countercultural statement. I have learned to be content. That's scary to the Wall Street crowd. It's frightening to the Madison Avenue advertisers. It's heresy to the politicians who want you to spend, spend, spend so that they can talk about how the, the consumer has confidence. It is unbelievable to the millions of mall maniacs that flock to every store opening as if it was a holy shrine. Be content. Be satisfied. But wait. How does that apply in these days of quarantine as we wait to hear about our job, as we try to navigate the state's unemployment website, and we work all of this with the kids at home? I mean, how many Zoom meetings can you go to in a day and keep your sanity? Does Paul really mean that we should be content today in these circumstances? His answer would be yes even in these circumstances. Because contentment is not driven by circumstances, it is driven by the strength of God. Remember this, when Paul writes these words, he too is in quarantine. When Paul writes these words, he's under house arrest. He can't leave his house there in Rome. But he is declaring he has learned to be content. And he's thinking primarily about financial and material things when he talks about contentment. You see, contentment will take you off the consumption bandwagon. One day soon, we will be able again to browse in the stores. One day soon, we'll be able again to walk through the malls. And, and when you do that, if you want to blow someone's mind as you look at all the products there in the store, declare out loud, you know, I don't need any of this. You know, I don't want any of this. I have everything I want. I'm content just as I am. That'll get some people upset, but that's what we should do. Thomas Kempis said it this way, choose rather to want less than to have more. You can be content right now. You can step off the credit card charging bandwagon right now. It'll free you financially for the future. It'll give you a greater ability to participate and support the work of the Lord. You do not need any of the stuff on Amazon today because there is a theological route to contentment and you can find it. The theological route to contentment comes from trusting in God's providence, His care for you. The writer to the Hebrews puts it this way in chapter 13. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do? do to me. Did you catch the motivation for contentment there? It's because God is present. Since He sees me and He loves me and He knows me, I can trust Him in this situation. He is providentially working out the details for my blessing, for your blessing, and so I can trust Him. You see, contentment is not apathy. Contentment is not taking a whatever approach to life and just kind of floating through your existence. No ambition, no desires, no dreams, no aspirations, as if we're just kind of in a blissed out haze of indifference. That's not contentment. That's laziness. Contentment is actively trusting in God's providential care. It is rooted in the knowledge that our lives are in God's hands. Therefore, I do not need to panic and I do not need to manipulate people or circumstances. I can trust Him. As, as you put your head on your pillow tonight, remember this. God is in charge. Are you having some struggles sleeping? 
you know what I'm hearing anecdotally through people and stories of what's going on as they're in their shelter in place and, and reacting to this pandemic? I'm hearing that many people are struggling in their sleep patterns. Many people are finding themselves just not able to fall asleep or stay asleep and there's kind of a, an anxiety that they can't really even pinpoint that somehow is disturbing them. As you put your head on your pillow today, remember, God is in charge and He is able. Until you trust that through all the seasons of your life that God is going to be faithful, you're never really going to be content because discontent causes us to want to be in charge. Discontentment makes us want to control everything. And, and when you want to control everything, it's because you're not trusting. You're not trusting the one who is greater. You'll never be content until you truly believe that God is working out the events of life for His glory and our good. And those two things can come together, His glory and our good. And the providential care of God is always near. That's the theological basis for contentment. And it comes down to real life choices, to very practical everyday choices. Hebrews 13, 5, once again, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. What strikes me about that passage is it is written in the form of a command. Be content. Do this. Choose this. Now, you and I both know that you cannot command something that you don't control. You can't, for instance, come up to a bald man and say, I want you to grow hair. Go ahead. Try. Push. Push hard, as if pushing could make him grow hair. No matter how hard he pushes, he's not going to be able to grow hair because you can't command something that can't be controlled. And God knows that. So when he commands something, it is something that he knows we can choose to do, that he knows we can control. Contentment is learned behavior based on the choice to trust God. And that brings us back to Philippians chapter 4, because in verse 11, Paul puts it this way, I have learned to be content. He's saying, this is, I didn't always know this. I didn't always get this. I didn't always have the mastery of this, but I have learned it. And he's learned it because he's listening to a different call, a different voice, if you will, than the voice of the world. You see, we have learned discontent. We are taught discontent. And discontentment is based on a lie that man is man-made, based on a falsehood that teaches there is no one watching you, there is no one caring for you, there is no one watching over you. That is a lie. And believing that lie, what happens is we base our choices on a, on a foundation of discontent. And it doesn't matter how much you gain, how much you get, that discontent will always continue. It will consume you. I mentioned last week that when our cup runneth over, first thing we want is a bigger cup. That's the kind of culture that we live in. Paul says, not me. I've learned to be content. And I don't say this in regards to need. In other words, he's not saying, uh, I'm aware of my needs. I'm not thinking only about what I don't have. He's thinking about what he does have in God. I mean, imagine his situation. He's under house arrest. Now, what that means in this culture and in this day and age is that he has to provide his own rent to pay for that house that he's arrested in. He has to provide somehow through others, through, through the generosity of people, his own food to, to live in the house where he's arrested. But he, he recognizes that his basic needs are being met. His basic needs are being satisfied. And so he considers himself blessed and content. 
In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul writes it this way, Godliness with contentment is great gain. See, he's made a choice not to let the culture dictate his needs. And he has received that great gain, receiving joyfully what God will provide. Whatever comes, whatever his supply, Paul receives it with joy. What we're tempted to call need, he sees as extra, as want. His basic needs are met. All of this is not easy. It's not easy to pull away from the current of greed. It's not easy to step out of the river of dissatisfaction. But we, followers of Jesus, we must do it. We must pray about it. We must trust God more in it and be radical enough to obey this command and choose contentment. And when we do, we find that there is a victorious life that comes no matter the circumstances. Look with me at verse 12. Paul says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Contentment, victory, no matter what the circumstances. How do you get there? How does Paul get there? Well, of course, he has that theological basis covered. He has rooted himself and and, and is secure in the providential care of God. But then on a human level, on a daily level, he has trained his thinking in certain ways, and we too must train our thinking. For instance, We must think and talk about wants versus needs on a regular basis. Ask yourself, is this something that I want or something that I really need? Let's keep these categories straight. Here's the point. It is not a sin for you to buy something that you want when you can afford it. But it is a sin to mix up these categories and purchase what you can't afford because you're being pushed along by the culture's priorities, motivated by the world. Let me boil it down even further. It's wrong for us to charge stuff that we don't need and pay the bank finance charges on stuff that are not necessities. That's wrong because it's not good stewardship. When it's an item that we want, when it's in the categories of the wants, it's fine to pursue it. But it's something that we should save up for and be able to purchase. We learn to defer pleasure. Why? Because I trust in God's providence. I don't have to manipulate the situation. I don't have to run ahead. I don't have to just do it all myself. To have victory in any circumstance. Examine Motives for purchases. Why do I want to purchase this? Is it just the excitement of getting something new that I'm after? Is it just that I love it when the box arrives and I'm able to open it up and pull whatever it is out and that excitement quickly goes away? That excitement is addicting, like any drug. But we need to recognize that that is not a worthy motive for purchasing. To live above our circumstances in any situation, we need to be filled with a desire to see God's purposes accomplished in your family, in your own life. God's glory and your good, they come together. And when we truly believe that, God's glory and my good will come together as I walk by faith. What happens is the opportunities for ministry open up before us, not only in cheerful giving to support the ministry, but in serving and in doing those things that are a blessing to others and and good for the Word of God and, and the proclamation of the gospel. In short, we are to model our thoughts and our pattern of life more like Paul. Verse 13, here's what he says. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. He's talking about being content there. It's not a claim to some personal achievement. 
Unfortunately, this is what I call one of the top 10 abused Bible verses because it's often taken out of context. It's made its way to T-shirts and bumper stickers and sports athletic circles uh, as if he's talking about personal achievement. I can win the game. I can run the marathon. I can lift the weights. But that's really not what Paul's focus is as he makes this very positive statement. He says, I can be content whatever comes my way. Because it is God's strength that strengthens me to do that. It's not the circumstances, and it's not just me. I'm strengthened by Jesus. Here's a story that's touched me over the years. It's a true story about, uh, about Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry was an author and a preacher and a Bible scholar many generations ago. He died in 1714. But before he died, he was once robbed he wasn't a rich man, wasn't well-to-do, but his house was broken into, and they stole his money and some of his possessions. And that night, Matthew Henry did what he did every night. He took out his diary, and he wrote down his thoughts about the day. And the day that he was robbed, this is what he wrote. He said, let me be thankful. First, because he never robbed me before. Second, because although he took my purse, he did not take my life. And because although he took all I possess, it wasn't much. And fourth and most importantly, because it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. Follow God and you will learn to be able to be content in any circumstance. And the Apostle Paul knew this contentment partly because he realized that the experience he was living in this physical life was the shortest part of his existence. You see, he knew that eternity would follow. He knew that he would be with the Lord in glory. And those of you who know Christ as personal Savior, you know that as well. But I wonder if all of us who are watching this webcast have that hope. In Romans 10, 9, and 10, it says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What does it mean? It means we're saved from an empty life, a greedy life here in this existence, and saved from an eternity in hell away from God in the life to come. And we're saved to forgiveness, a new life here on earth, and a promise of heaven. And that brings peace and contentment here today. Everything is settled. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And you gain that rest in Christ through faith. Faith brings you to a relationship with Him. Even as our sin separates us from God, we need to recognize that the penalty of that sin was already paid by Jesus on the cross. And what He wants to do now is apply to your heart the forgiveness that He already earned for you. But it doesn't happen automatically. You need to reach out by faith. You see, Jesus is still giving peace. He's still giving contentment. He's still offering promise today. And if that's what you need, you know it because the Holy Spirit of God is telling you so. And if right now what you need is to find peace with God and you're ready to extend your faith in what Christ has done for you, I'm going to help you do that. Because faith happens on the inside and it's expressed to God in a prayer. And I'm going to help you pray a simple prayer. For those of you who need to say yes to Jesus for the first time. But for all of us, why don't we bow our heads and close our eyes and enter into an attitude of prayer. And if you need particularly the peace with God that Jesus offers, you pray this prayer with me. Silently where you sit, God will hear. You pray this. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I lack peace. I lack peace of mind, peace of heart. I lack peace with God. But I believe that you can give it to me as you forgive my sin and make me your child. I believe you died on the cross and paid my penalty. I believe you rose again. 
And right now, Lord, I want to start over with you. I want to be born again into your family. Make me your child. And Lord, I don't know who has prayed that prayer, but I believe that there are those who are watching this webcast who are saying yes to you for the first time and are entering this journey with you that will bring peace and contentment like nothing else. And for many of us who have already made that choice and who are tuning in to this webcast to worship, to grow, Lord, we need this challenge every day to think differently, to be different than the world, and to look to you for contentment and help. So help us do that. Help us live those lives of difference so that we can be seen as the representatives of Christ. Help us, we pray, for we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior today, I'd like to send you this book entitled, Now What? It's a a subtitle, Living Out Your Christian Faith. It's some very good advice in terms of how to walk this journey of faith with Jesus. But in order for me to send it to you, I need to know your contact information. So the way we do that is this. If you prayed uh, to accept Christ today, would you text the word faith to 209-257-8768? That's 209-257-8768. We'll respond to you with a a text that will ask you to send your contact information. Once you fill out that form, text it back to us. I'll be able to send that booklet to you, uh, and it'll be on its way right away. Well, now we have another chance to worship in song. Let's do that together. As we close the service this morning, let's remind ourselves to build our life on the love of God. Let's sing out that our God is worthy together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. true name of Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Sing it out with us. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken, and I will build my life upon your love it is 
In closing today, let's hear these words from Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. May those be the qualities that are evident in our lives this coming week. God bless you and thank you for joining in our worship service today. We'll see you next week. To those around me. To those around me.